honor you today, Lord Jesus. We welcome you in this house, God. Your presence is welcome in this house. Your anointing is welcome in this house. Your being is welcome in this house. And your peace is is welcome in this house in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Again, we welcome you here at Life Changers. We welcome our online family who has not been, um, is, is, is watching us via Facebook this morning. We welcome you. Let's just give them a hand for being faithful. Amen. We're so thankful for technology, although I love people in the room a whole lot better. But we're so thankful for technology that God can use and that, that can go out for, you know, for years and years and years. And so actually from state to state, even across the country, across the world, people can watch um, these messages and get blessed by the Lord. And so we're just thankful for that. But we welcome you on Life Changers today. We're just going to talk for a few minutes about a, a subject that most of us have done every now and then. It's called sidetracked. Have you ever been sidetracked? Have you ever been, um, you know, got yourself a little bit um, disoriented, maybe distracted every now and then? We all have, and if we say we haven't, we may not be telling the truth because we've all been sidetracked at one time or another. On Wednesday night, if you caught the message, the Facebook Live with Pastor Todd and I, we talked about prayer and why we should pray and how important that it is that we pray and that our prayers really can change things. And I spoke about a passage of Scripture in 2 Kings 20 that talks about King Hezekiah and what a man of God he was and how God heard his prayers and God, and God changed his life, literally changed his life. King Hezekiah was sick. Uh, Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, God said to tell you to get your house in order because you're going to die. Now, how many of you know if, the, if, if somebody came to you and said, God said, get your house in order that you were going to die, you probably would look at things a whole lot different and change the way you do some things, maybe tweak some things a little bit. Maybe some things that were important to you five minutes ago won't be important to you now, Right? And so Isaiah said, Hezekiah, get your life in order, your house in order, because you're going to die. And Hezekiah began to pray, probably like he's never prayed before, right? You get that phone call in the middle of the night, you've not been a prayer, and you've not got on your knees. You'll get on your knees, and you'll pray like you've never prayed before. And you'll pray with some fervency, and that's exactly what Hezekiah did. And God, came, Isaiah came back to him, and he said, God told me to tell you that he's, he's heard your prayer. And he's going to add 15 years to your life healed. He's going to heal your body and add 15 years to your life. Just because of his prayer. Well, he, he, he didn't have a problem receiving the word from Isaiah that he was going to die, the negative report. But when God says you're going to live, then he wanted a sign. That's what he asked for. He asked God to give him a sign. Lord, you give me a sign that you said I was going to live. And so you know what God did? God gave him a sign. He turned the sun back 10 degrees, put his shadow instead of before him, put his shadow behind him, something that cannot be done in the natural. That was a miraculous sign that God gave him. Nobody could explain that. And so when he got that word, he began to walk in that. And so it tells us that our prayers can actually change the plans of God. We all the time think that, you know, God can't be changed. Well, God doesn't change, right? He doesn't change. But the plans that, that are laid out for you can be changed by your prayers. Why pray otherwise? Why would it matter? I believe that my prayers can move mountains. The Bible says that if I have the faith to believe it, that I can believe that a mountain can be moved, and I choose to do that. Is the mountain always moved? Not always. Sometimes i got to climb it, right? But God's always there. He answers in his way and in his time, but he always answers our prayers. So he wanted a sign that he was going to live. God gave him the turn the sun back 10 degrees, and so this shows that we need to pray. If you've never been a prayer and you think it doesn't matter, you need to understand that this is a great example that you need to pray. So we're going to go back to Hezekiah for just a minute and, and, and talk about him for just a moment. He was a king, and he loved God. He loved God. He, he made wise decisions. The Bible says that there wasn't a king before him like him, and there's not never been a king since him like him, and never will be. He was special. He was favored. But in all of Hezekiah's greatness and wisdom, he allowed himself to do a very, very unwise thing. Have you ever been unwise? Have you ever made bad decisions? Even loving Jesus? Even having God's favor? 
even having God's blessings. Have you ever made a bad decision in your life? Yes, you probably have. So I'm going to go to, to, um, to 2 Kings 20, 12 and 13, because this is actually after Hezekiah was healed, his enemy paid him a visit. It says, at that time, Marduk, Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. And Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his army and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show, did not show them. So if you want to think about that for just a minute, for somebody to be so wise, he didn't make such a wise decision. When the enemy came to him face to face to find out, hey, I've heard that you've been, you've been, you know, you're cured of this disease that you have and you're really not going to die. And they came to his, to, to bring him gifts. He began to, to get a little bit um, within himself. And he invited the enemy to come in. Not only did he invite him to come in, he, he took him on a tour through the palace, showed him everything he had, even showed him his armory, his ammunition. He may have even told him how it worked if they didn't know. That would kind of be equivalent to President um, Trump, you know, uh, going to the door of the White House where a terrorist that he knew was a terrorist was standing at the door, and he opens up the door, and he takes him in, and he takes him into his secretive office, that's got all of the hidden secrets and how they're going to win the battle against the enemy, and he shows them everything. That's very foolish, not a very smart thing to do. Why would Hezekiah do this? Because it makes no sense. And, and looking at it from our perspective, it seems like a completely ridiculous thing to do, right? Maybe even a ludicrous thing to do. And, but here is actually what happened at that moment when Hezekiah was doing that. 2 Chronicles 32, 31 tells us, and it's talking about Hezekiah at the time. It says, but when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him, Hezekiah, about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. Well, what it really means there, not that God physically left him because God's everywhere, but God stepped back. Quit speaking for a minute. And he waited to see how Hezekiah was going to handle himself. It was a test. He tested him. He tested him to know what was in his heart. He didn't offer moral support or guidance, or he didn't even have any writing on the wall. And he made him stand on his own to see exactly what was in his heart, because whatever was in his heart is what God would judge him by, correct? The Bible says God doesn't see the outside. He sees the inside. That's why we can't be judges of people. Because, because we don't know their true heart. God does. So this is where a, a man who loved God, prayed to God, trusted God, had God's favor, was led by God, he will be able to reveal that deep down in his heart he had a hidden flaw. And one of the flaws was that he had pride. Now the Bible says that there's three kinds of sin. There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so pride was actually what showed up with Hezekiah when he was put to the test by God, and God wasn't there kind of in his ear giving him directions and guidance. Why would I say that he's prideful? Well, because he, he, he took God completely out of the equation and began to show off. Didn't say anything about God healing him. So we have to think for a minute, why does God do what he does? Why does, why does he bless us? He does it to get praise. Why does, he, why does he do what he does? He does it to get glory. Why, why does he heal us? To give us a testimony to share so that he can get the credit and he can get the glory. One of the biggest things that I have the hardest time with is when we are in, um, you know, just speaking with other pastors or maybe people that, that want to become a pastor and, and they hear, you know, how that God has blessed life changers and how it grew kind of fast and, and how, you know, it's grown over the years. And they'll say, what's your secret? Like, what have you all done? And we're like, listen to God. Do what he says. Like, we can't write a book about that, right? Because it doesn't take very long. We can say it in a sentence. We just listen to God. We can't take the credit. We can't take the glory. 
God has to have that. If we try to take it for ourselves, then pride rises up and it becomes about us and not about him. And at that point, his blessings will stop. So when Hezekiah had the perfect opportunity to share his healing and blessing with someone who did not believe in the same God, someone who needed to hear what a God who was alive and well, how he could do miracles and and what he was capable of, Hezekiah chose to show off all of his treasures, his wealth, his power. He took all the glory and all the credit. He chose to brag and boast about what he had and what he had done. At that moment, there was no sharing what God did for him. There was no giving God credit for his healing. There was no sharing that he had prayed to God Almighty who set the sun back, right? Who set the sun back for him, healed him of a disease. He was sidetracked. When his enemies knocked on the door to see for themselves that he was healed, that was a perfect opportunity to speak on God's behalf and to testify what God had done, the only one that could fix him. He could testify to that. He could tell him how powerful that God was, and he can tell him, see, I am still alive, and you, have, you can't destroy me, king of Babylon, because they were his enemies. It was his opportunity to, to open up the door, to give a little testimony of what God had done, and close the door and let them leave. But instead, he got full of himself. All of a sudden, it was so much about him that he became sidetracked to the point that he completely let his guard down. And he invited the enemy in to see all his treasures, but also to see what was in his heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. If, if you're an evil person on the inside, it will show. You can't hide that long. If you're a great person on the inside, it'll show. It'll come out. If you're a godly person that it's all about Jesus, you can't help but talk about him. You can't help but share. Everything you do, good or bad, every intent, good or bad, comes from your heart. Comes from your heart. You need to remember this. That's why we need to guard the heart. We don't want to get sidetracked and let the enemy in. Hezekiah's guests came to trap him, and that's exactly what they did. Because they first befriended him. Be careful who you friend. Not everybody is your friend. They can buy you gifts. They brought him gifts, didn't they? They can buy you gifts. They can tell you all the things that you want to hear. They can be there for you all the time. But do you really know the intents of their heart? So be careful who you befriend. Second, he got sidetracked. After he got sidetracked, third, he let his guard down. And fourth... He showed them all of his artillery, where it was, and maybe in his selfish moment, he did show them how it worked. I don't know. I wasn't there. But before we judge and criticize him, because it's easy to criticize other people, and, you know, we're, we're on this side of, of King Hezekiah's story, and it's easy for us to sit back and say, man, what a fool, right? How foolish was that? But we have to think about it for just a minute. We have to step back, and we need to realize that we are all living in real life right now. And it happens all the time. We get sidetracked. We get distracted. It may have even happened to you a time or two. Maybe you're distracted right now. And I have to ask you this. What do you do when no one's watching? What do you do when God isn't clearly directing you and guiding you at that moment? You can't hear his voice. When you pray, your prayers aren't being answered. What do you do? A lot of times people fall apart. They got to have somebody carrying them all the time. And when God steps back, I don't know if you've ever heard that statement that, that any time there's a test, the teacher is silent during a test. As cliche as that sounds, it's very true. When God puts us through a test, sometimes he sets back very quietly because he wants to see how we're going to respond. He's looking to see what's in our heart. He's trying to bring out all that stuff on the inside so he can make us a better us for his glory. Are you easily sidetracked? Do you easily lose your focus? Do you quickly forget the word that God has spoken over you? We've spoken words over people or heard words spoken over people, and they'll, they'll receive it, and they'll walk right out the door, and as soon as they get home and they have an argument with their spouse, they forget all about it. They get sidetracked. The enemy will not come to you with a, with, with a pitchfork and devil ears. He's going to come to you with a smile on his face. He's going to look inviting and very appealing. Otherwise, you wouldn't get sidetracked. Once you welcome him in to your circle and to your life, you've set yourself up to be defeated. 
And a lot of times God tests us just like he tested King Hezekiah. God left him to test him and to see what was in his heart, but he failed the test miserably. He failed the test. Has God ever done anything for you, given you an opportunity um, to, to share it, and instead you made it a, a miracle about yourself? That's called pride. Has he ever told you to stay away from something or someone and pride rose up in you because, you know what, you, you got all that Jesus inside of you and you're better than that. That ain't going to affect you. You're going to do it anyway. That's called pride. Has God ever said no and you've said yes? That's pride. You know, I've been thinking about this, um, this pandemic thing that's been going on for the last four months. And I know that COVID-19 is real. I actually have um, a friend that her dad passed away with it in Oklahoma City. Very godly man. And he didn't pass away because he didn't have faith. Because he had a family that was praying for him in his sickest hour, believing that God would heal him this side of heaven, but that did not happen. So I know it's a serious thing. Don't ever think that we don't think it's serious. But I believe that the enemy is using this as a tactic to spread fear around our world. And like I said earlier, God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And if he can keep us completely in fear, we will stay at home, pull the shades closed, cover up with our fuzzy blanket, and we'll never go out and witness for his glory. Right? How many people have done that? I get it. But I don't get it. I will not let fear run me. I will take all necessary precautions to stay healthy, and we hope you do as well. We try to do that here. But you can't be living in a life of fear, in a state of fear all the time. That is not God's plan for your life. And when I think about the churches being shut down, you know, there's been people that's asked us in the past when we were shut down, hey, are you guys going to do a, you know, are you going to do a, um, a drive-in church? Well, I think that's a great thing. But God told us no. So if we come in and we tell you what God told us no, then you're going to think, yeah, right. God told us no. And here's what he said. I want the people of life changers to hunger for me. I want them to thirst after me. I don't want them to have that building. I want them to, to seek me for themselves, to find me for who I really am. It was a test of our heart. It was a test of our heart. It was a test to see what we have deep down inside. A test to see where we stand in our walk with God. If we keep on walking, even when we, want, we don't want to, even when we're having a bad day, we still keep walking. Even when things aren't going our way and we can't see God doing anything, we still know he's God and we still proclaim he's God. Even when we're believing for healing and somebody dies and goes on to heaven, when we don't get to keep them here, we still know he's a healer. This side of heaven, amen? We still know he can raise people from the dead. We, had a, we had a, have a, um, a pastor and his wife that we know that live in, in North Carolina. And they're great godly people. Got a great family. And, and I got the privilege of meeting her back in February, right before all this stuff happened. And she'd been battling cancer since last summer. And honestly, I bet that woman could preach the lights out. Even in her weakness during that time, she seemed strong. I knew God was going to heal her. I had no doubt in my mind that she was going to be healthy and, and sitting in her church, you know, and, and, and preaching the lights out as, as for years. And we attended her funeral this past week. Did not know that she was going to go to heaven. We, we actually did not know she had gotten so sick. And when we got the word, we were devastated that she had passed. But in her daughters, um, sharing one, one of the testimonies that one of her daughters shared, and I might not get this exactly right, but she was reading scriptures over her the day her mama died. And she was reading a scripture in Deuteronomy that talked about living and her mom on her deathbed in a strong voice. And we all know that on your deathbed, that's one thing you don't have is strength in your voice. And in her strong voice, she said, I will live. I will live. And today she's living in heaven, celebrating with the God that she has served her whole life. And you know what we still do? We still preach that God's a healer this side of heaven. That will never stop because we know that he is. It's a test to see where we stand in our walk with God. Are we going to fall apart because we can't sit in a service? Three times a week? Shame on us. 
I don't mean that ugly and I don't mean that bad, but Jesus is coming soon. He's coming back. And we got to know that it's coming. It's coming quickly. We've got to be able to stand when the world's on fire. Otherwise, they don't want what we've got. If the church falls apart, why do sinners want it? If we don't serve a God that's bigger than all this and we can't proclaim it, even though we can't see it yet, what he's doing in this whole thing, if we can't stand and proclaim that he's still bigger, then, then what do we have? Nobody wants that. Pastor Todd and I, we did some goofy stuff on, on Facebook Live. We don't do, I don't stuff my face full of marshmallows for just everybody. <laughs> Pastor Zach, we, we did all this crazy stuff, the, the, first, the beginning of it. You know why? Because we don't want you to think we're falling apart. If your pastor falls apart, then what do you think we are? You're going to say, man, he ain't got the goods. She ain't got the goods. She's not all that. They don't love God like they say. But the world was falling apart. The church was falling apart. At a time when the church should be lifting each other up, the church is trying to tear each other down. Let me see if I can go see if they're being COVID compliant. compliant. Let me see if they're cleaning down the doorknobs. Do you have church? Do you not have church? If you don't have church, people think you don't have faith. If you do have church, they're going to come and see what you're doing wrong. Right? I found out recently, here recently in the last couple of weeks, they have what they call a governor's rat line. And there was one church in our, in our county that got told on. Now, we've not been con contacted by them. We were contacted from somebody that just went on the website to see who'd been, you know. That's okay. We're doing the best we can. We welcome anybody to come in and see and show us what we need to do better. Right? We don't have one thing to hide. We're just trying to share Jesus. So it comes at a time when we know that the churches are stepping against one another. That probably didn't come from a sinner. Shame on us. Jesus is coming back, and we're worried about who's wiping down a doorknob. Come on. This has been a test when community and relationships aren't there. What do you do? What do you do when you can't leave your house? What do you do when you go in Walmart and you have to wear a mask? You wear your mask. If they tell you to wear it, wear it. Are you passing the test? Have you passed the test? During these four months, what have you been doing with yourself? Listen, we all complain about the, the, the mandates and all that stuff. I've done my share. I'm tired of it. Tired of it. Sick of it. But I know God's got a plan. And I'm not going to fall apart. Because this is a test. The enemy's knocking on the door. I'm not going to let him in. The truth seems to be, really, that a lot of people have failed the test very miserably. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. If we aren't paying attention, he will use anyone or anything that he needs to do just that. He knows your weakness. He can't read your mind, but if he puts a thought in your, in your mind and you act on that thought, he's got you. That's where he knows. Do you think he doesn't pay attention to you? He does. He wants to kill you and destroy you. And a lot of times people will say, well, hey, you know, it's my decision. Like, it, it doesn't matter. It's my decision. It won't affect anybody but me. You know, my body, my choice. That's what they say about abortion. My body, my choice. It's their body, their choice. But when it comes to COVID and going to church, it's not your body and your choice. You have to stay home because we want to protect you. Not true. Don't be deceived. I'm not here to speak politics. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. And if you can't see that revelation is unfolding before your eyes, then you're not paying attention. But Hezekiah is a good, a good example of how his decisions did not even affect him. They affected everybody after him. 
If you go on to read in 2 Kings 20, 14 through 21, I'll probably stop a little bit short. It says, Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? He said, They saw everything in my palace. There's nothing among my treasures that I didn't show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, all your predecessors have stored up until this day, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Here's what Hezekiah says. He said, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good. That doesn't mean he thinks it's a good word. It just means he accepts it. Hezekiah replied, for he thought, he didn't say it, he thought it. That's part of that coming out of his heart. It says, he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? He didn't even care that his decisions affected his kids because it wasn't going to affect anybody until he was gone. Don't live your life like your decisions don't affect everybody that's coming up behind you. You might not feel the repercussions of it, but your kids may. Your grandkids may. The decisions that you make today will affect the people that come up behind you. When we allow the enemy to see our heart and our deepest desires, we can find ourselves stripped of all the blessings of the Lord. We can also find ourselves broken. We can find ourselves not walking under the protection of our Heavenly Father, or we may just find, if it doesn't affect us, we may just find our children or our grandchildren struggling to find their way, right? Living like there's no tomorrow with no concern for eternity. They've not seen the example. You never made them go to church. They get big enough to, to back talk you. You'd rather just go to church and leave them in the bed than to put up with the fight. That's the devil. Don't leave those kids in that bed. You bring their toothbrush with them, but you make sure you bring their toothbrush in. You make them brush their teeth when they get here. <laughs> you bring them to church. Don't give them an option. It's not an option. We may find our kids enslaved to sin, feeling trapped and hopeless. And Hezekiah was okay with it because he said, well, it's not going to affect me. There's that pride ring up again, right? And here's the sad part about this whole thing. One of the saddest parts about this whole thing, I say. He would, have, he would have been better off to have died of that disease than to have opened up that door and let that enemy in. Wow. I want everybody to stand all over the building, and i got to ask you a question. I feel like, as a whole, everybody's being tested through this COVID thing. I really do. But you also may be going through another test in your life. And how do you act? What do you do when God is not directing every move that you are making? Or he's not sending a prophet to give you a word? Or he's not putting you in a church pew or church seat that you can hear something from him other than what you're getting when you're feeding yourself? What do you do? There's no doubt that we've all been sidetracked. We all get distracted. We all fail test every now and then. But today we have a chance to say, you know what, God? I never thought about it before like that. But because I've heard it the way that I've heard it, it makes sense to me now, and I'm responsible for what I know. So, Lord, today I, I just need to ask you to, I want to reverse this. Like, I want to pray, God, that you'll change this situation. You'll change my heart. You'll, you'll help me to be the person that you've called me to be. And, and, and Lord, I, I'll do everything that you've called me to do. Because you know what? God created each and every person in this building, in this world. If people has been created, God had a plan for them. Even if the parents might not have planned that pregnancy, God had a plan for that baby. It wasn't to be aborted. It was, the, it was to have the opportunity to live. And to be what God has called that baby to be. You are the same. What are you doing for his kingdom? 
when he does something for you, are you, are you blessing him for it? Are you sharing it with people? Do you tell them? Like, I, I, have a, I have a story from Rosie this morning after first service, and, and I've got this story that I've shared a hundred times. And when I, when I lived, before I got married and I lived on my own, I was living in Texas, and my family was 1,500 miles away as far as my mom and dad. And, and I had family down there that would have taken care of me, but I remember feeling like I had to do this on my own. And I was getting ready to go to work one morning, and my hairspray, which is very important to me, my hairspray was empty. The can was empty. I promise it was empty. There was nothing that could be shaken. You couldn't hear anything. And I had a, I had a, a good job, but I had bills. Like, I had a home to pay for, you know. I took care of myself. And I said, God, I need this hairspray, man. I need this deodorant. Like, I really need this deodorant. And every time I would spray that aerosol can of deodorant, that aerosol can of hairspray, that hairspray would come out. I promise it did. And that can was empty. And I have shared that silly testimony for 30 years. Because God takes care of his kids. And I will bless his name, and I will testify as to what he can do. And Rosie came in this morning. She said, Pastor Tammy, I got a story for you. I got a Pastor Tammy story. I fixed my hair this morning, and I needed to spray my bangs back, and picked up my can, and didn't have any sound. And I said, okay, God, if you can do it for Pastor Tammy, you can do it for me. She sprayed, and she said, Jeff can testify. My bangs are good. What are you testifying as to what God can do? What are you saying about what he can do? We had somebody last week come to us, and they, they have a business, and God has really been blessing them financially, and, 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 and they were almost, like, embarrassed at, you know, what do I tell people when they say? You know, the first thing people say when you get something new is they say, well, we, we can sure tell who's got the money. And we said, you go back to those people that said that. And you said, that money comes from hard work and paying my tithes. And God has blessed me. Don't you be ashamed of the blessings of the Lord. If I was driving around in a 76 Pinto and that's what I had, I'd bless him for it. I'd thank him for it. I had a 76 Mustang that was a hot mess. It's a stick shift and it was an ugly color. And God gave me that car, and I loved it, and I took care of it. And I thank him for that. Everything you have come from him. Everything. Whatever you have, you give him glory for. Whatever you get, you give him praise. That's why he gives you what he gives you. He is, he is selfish within himself. He is a jealous God, the word says. He won't, he won't share his glory with anybody. And he certainly won't share it with me. And he's not going to share it with you. So we might as well give him glory for it. What we have, what we don't have, thank you, Jesus. If I don't have it, you may, you must, you may not want me to have it. It might become an idol. I might forget to praise you. Don't ever be ashamed to give God praise for what he's done for you. So I want everybody to close their eyes. Nobody looking around. We are so blessed. Last Sunday, 14 people gave their hearts to the Lord, and we give God glory for that. We are in, this, in the business of soul winning. That's what we do. And then once people get saved, we want to see them become everything God has called them to be. We want to see them be able to stand when the world's on fire. But if you're standing here today and you say, you know what, I'm not even saved. Like, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Don't you be ashamed of that. Maybe the day you want to have. And if you do, just slip your hand up. Nobody's looking around. And if they are and I catch them, I'll call them out. Amen. Just kidding. So if you're in here this morning and you, you are saved, but you know that, you know what, you've been guilty of being distracted and sidetracked, I want you to raise your hand. Don't be ashamed of that. I can raise mine too. I've got mine up. We all are guilty of being sidetracked every now and then. 
You may not be you may not be sinning a big sin, but it may be something pride. It may be something that that God sees that He's not proud of, right? And so we're just going to pray and ask God to forgive us for that. Remember, we talked about in the beginning, prayer is important. What you pray can change God's plans for you, for this world. I want Jesus to come back today, but if he's not going to, I need him to help. I need to feel it and see it. I want people to know he's a big God and he can fix this mess anytime he wants to, any way he wants to. God, I just come to you and I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blessings. God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for giving us an opportunity to serve you, Heavenly Father. It is an honor to be your child. It is an honor to serve you today. God, I pray personally for myself that you will forgive me for every selfish motive, every prideful word, for the opportunities that maybe I didn't give you the glory when I should have, when I got distracted, maybe by being tired, for, for, for being worried about this COVID thing, for allowing fear to try to seep into my, to my spirit. I ask forgiveness for that, Lord. I know you're bigger. You've got the whole world in your hands. God, I, I pray for this congregation, for all of the hands that were raised, Heavenly Father, that today will be a, a life-changing day a life-changing moment, a life-changing word. They don't have to remember anything about me, but I want them to remember, God, what you have spoken in their spirit today. Let them carry that with them. We give you praise, Lord, for all things. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for souls that have been added to your kingdom, God, through this ministry over the years. We don't forget to praise you for that. Thank you, Lord, for people whose, whose lives have just been changed. We give you honor and glory for that today. May we keep our eyes on you and focus on you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. If you'll just be seated for just a second, I'm going to let you sit down for just a second so you can get your wallets, right? Because y'all thought we forgot that. We'd like to shake you up a little bit. We do appreciate everybody that has given to Life Changers throughout this ministry. Um, what you do give is very much appreciated. We really can't thank you enough. We try to thank you all the time, but I don't know that you'll ever really understand the magnitude of our thanks that we have for giving to Life Changers. Everything that every, every part of this ministry we give to the Lord, and we allow Him to take your money, and, and we allow Him to bless that and take care of Life Changers Christian Center. We get to take care of people. More than anything, we get to share the gospel, and that's the most important thing. So thank you for giving. There's several different ways that you can give. If you're new at Life Changers, you can obviously give by cash. We do cash. Cash or check. We'll even take a money order. But if you want to give via text, you can do so. Just um, text GIVE in the amount to 276 Three two five seven four four zero. You can give that way, or you can go to lifechangerscc.org and you can give that way. Those are two very safe ways of giving. Um, if you will just stand on your feet, we're going to pray and, and dismiss, and we'll dismiss our kids first. But if you'll just let us do that, or our parents, we want to dismiss first. But if you'll